in the Department of IZNG in IBSS. And I'm very happy to give today's seminar, Selection and Coevolutionary Optimization of Ecological Communities. Uh, quite a mouthful, but I sort of pulled this title out of the hat when I was uh, filling out the, the, the volunteer spreadsheet for this. Um, this is basically going to cover work, culmination of work that myself and colleagues have been doing who for many years now, both at the academy and elsewhere, it represents probably the, the most current uh, viewpoint on about 15 years of work. So even though I won't use the term complex systems a lot, uh, very much during the seminar today, everything that we'll be discussing will be about complex systems and about taking the view of ecological systems as complex systems. So there, there are many, many things that we need to know about complex systems. And the figure that you're looking at here is a distribution or a spreading ne network for the H1N1 virus, which those are uh, epi Pandemic and pandemic networks in themselves are complex systems also. And many complex systems that include things like the genome, ecosystems and communities that I'll be talking about today, transportation networks, financial networks, social networks, really have several properties in common. And that's why we're able to think about them in a common framework. First of all, by definition, a complex system like any other interactive system is made up of a set of interacting semi-independent units. In the case of the figure here, we're looking at people moving out from a central area, the source of that particular uh, pandemic and in infection into various parts of the world. In the case of what I'll be talking about today, mostly we'll be thinking of those units. The units we'll be thinking of will be species. Those units all have uh, evolving or changing properties. They have adaptive dynamics. So they change over time because of sort of internal intrinsic properties. And they also change because they're adapting to the changing context around them. Other units coming and going, various interactions coming and going, the strengths of those interactions changing. So it's a very dynamic system. Then there are, very importantly, there are things we call emergent properties. And an emergent property is some feature of the system, some feature of the network that is not a feature or characteristic of any of the entities or units in it. So in the case of, of a community, for example, or an ecosystem, when we talk about the stability of the system, so how persistent is that system? Or we talk about the resilience, how well does it respond to disturbances and how quickly might it bounce back? That is not a property that is based on any particular feature that any of the species in the system by themselves possess, but collectively, because of their interactions, this overall property em emerges. And then very, very importantly, and this is one that's often overlooked, is something we call path dependence. And path dependence means that these systems aren't made and remade constantly through time. What you have today is very much a result, is very much a product of what you had yesterday and the days preceding. So in the case of, of a pandemic, what you had, the situation that you have today, the network, the system that you have today is very much dependent on all of the steps that were taken to get you to this point in time. And in that sense, complex systems can differ very much from other kinds of systems that have no, no type of memory. So whenever you look through them in time, they're on average the same. That's not the true of complex systems, not the true of ecosystems, of transportation networks, of businesses, of societies, and so on. Now, taking all of these things together, and the fact that there's so many interacting pieces and features all the time means that predicting or forecasting the behavior and the futures of complex systems is inherently difficult. 
It's not impossible. It's far from being impossible, but it's very difficult. You need sufficient data, you need the correct types of data, and you need some understanding of how the system actually functions because almost always, more often than not, the types of functions and the types of interactions are what we uh, call nonlinear. Small changes can have very large and profound effects. And often you don't know what those changes are, what those effects are, until you've encountered them at least once. Okay, enough of complex systems. Let's get to the fossil record, which is what I'll be talking about today. <clears throat> what we're looking at here is probably the most famous figure in all of paleontology. It's what we call the Phanerozoic Biodiversity Curve. And the Phanerozoic is that period of time from what used to be the earliest appearance or occurrence of complex organisms on planet Earth. So multicellular, multi-parts, macroscopic, and they date back to the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago. We've since pushed that record back um, to probably we're in the range of about 620 million years now. But the modern world, what we might think of as a modern world, really gets started about 540 million years ago. And what this curve is showing, I don't know if you can see my point or not. I can. But what, <laughs> what we're looking at here is if we begin at that zero here, 540 million years in the past, the curve is tracing the diversity of marine families, and by families we mean groups of related uh, marine animals generally, we're looking at the number of marine families through time progressing all the way to time zero, which is a present day. And there are many, many interesting features of this history. So for example, in the vertical lines here, you'll see names like the End Ordovician, the Late Devonian, the Permo-Triassic. Uh, these are the big five mass extinctions when we had very uh, geologically rapid, dramatic decreases in diversity. One of the things to note here, though, is that we've divided up this curve into three colors, the modern, the Paleozoic, and the Cambrian. And what those refer to are things that we call the Sepkoski faunas. And they're named after the University of Chicago paleontologist, Jack Sepkoski, who, beginning in the 1980s, initially as part of his PhD research, undertook the task of trying to document all of the published, described published occurrences of marine animals through the Phanerozoic. So it's a vast literature. And you have to understand that when Jack started doing this, there was no Google. There were no digitized databases. So he spent about maybe 20 months initially in the library and U Chicago and between U Chicago, Harvard, Smithsonian, he had access to most of the necessary literature documenting all of these occurrences. And so what you're looking at is you can condense this down to the families, but we've since, bro since broken, it, broken it up so that we're, we can look at genera or the genus of an animal, and we can also look at individual species. It doesn't change the overall nature of that curve. And what we see, what's happening is that you, if you analyze the composition of the community, the global fossil community through time, there are three characteristic faunas that each one arises at some point in time and then slowly diminishes and either disappears or wanes in importance. So the very first one is a Cambrian fauna. And here's a rendering of this is, this is the early ocean. This is what it looked like. In many, some sense, you would recognize this. This is a marine scene. You're looking at animal types of organisms. But in many cases, most of these organisms are so unfamiliar to us or unfamiliar to many of you that it might as well be an alien planet. This is a Cambrian fauna. And even though almost all of the modern groups of marine animals can be traced back to the Cambrian, there are many other groups that were present in the Cambrian that are now extinct. And also many of the ancestors of our modern groups are barely recognizable as belonging to those groups. And just to point out also that this beautiful graphic here was actually made by Karina Helm, who is one of my SSI interns many, many years ago, now a very successful scientific illustrator. As we move on from the Cambrian fauna, the Cambrian fauna is around for 50 or 60 million years. <clears throat> 
and it's it. This is what dominates the oceans before the groups that characterize the Cambrian fauna begin to dwindle in diversity, lose their numbers, and they're replaced by the very long-lived Paleozoic fauna that persists up until 251 million years ago. And so here's an example of what the Paleozoic seafloor would have looked like, let's say 300 million, 400 million years ago. Much more familiar. On this one, we can see those sea lilies, their echinoderms, their crinoids. There's a cephalopod, the thing with the conical shell and lots of tentacles and so on. There are fish of various types, armored fish or placoderms. There's an ancient shark in the background. The Paleozoic is very different from the Cambrian fauna. And even though it's more familiar to us, it's also very different from the modern fauna. Paleozoic seas tended to be dominated by animals that spent their time sitting on the sleep floor, not moving very much, and making their living primarily from filter feeding out of the water column around them. Now shown here, that fish in the upper right is Duncleosteus, an armored uh, placoderm fish. It's uh, one of the largest predators of Paleozoic seas. It's also been measured as having one of the most powerful bite forces in the history of the animal kingdom. And Duncleosteus, and there's a little human next to it uh, for scale, was definitely a fearsome predator. However, Duncleosteus probably wouldn't have made it in the modern era. In terms of its biomechanics, it would have been rather sluggish. Um, and then just a quick shout out here also, the fact that we know anything about that bite force record of Duncleosteus is due to this model shown here in the upper right. This It's now at the uh, Field Museum in Chicago, and that work was done by Mark Westneat at the University of Chicago and one of his PhD students, Phil Anderson, who was my very first uh, SSI intern, is now Dr. Phil Anderson somewhere off in Germany. Anyway, moving forward, beginning around 250 million years ago, the Paleozoic fauna takes a nosedive and is replaced by what we call the modern fauna. And we've had the modern fauna around now for the past quarter of a billion years. It's changed very much in its characteristics. So here we see an ancient Mesozoic ocean. We have these giant marine reptiles, giant fish, giant ammonites. There's a former postdoc for scale there, Ashley Deneen. And even though we no longer have these giant ammonites or giant marine reptiles roaming the modern oceans, the characteristics of these marine communities have not changed very much. We still have giant marine vertebrates in the ocean. The giant marine vertebrates in the oceans today, just like back then, tend to be dominated by groups who returned uh, to the ocean from a terrestrial ancestry. In this case, marine reptiles. Today we have uh, cetaceans, whales and dolphins and so on, as well as seals, sea lions, what have you. Now this is in a sense, a history of change, and we, we expect this from the fossil record. It's what you have in mind when you think about the history of life. However, one of the things that's a lasting uh, difficulty for us to explain and is probably the most interesting feature of this entire breakdown of Phanerozoic history is not the change, but it's a non-change. So here we have, if we look at the Paleozoic fauna, the Paleozoic fauna dominated the oceans for a significantly long period of time, about a quarter of a billion years. And even though species come and go, and you could distinguish a Devonian marine community from a Carboniferous com marine community, they're dominated by essentially the same lineages of organisms and the same types of organisms making their living in the same sort of way. And so even though there's changes of detail, species evolving, species going extinct, the characteristic of that fauna remains the same for a very long period of time. You'll also notice this plateau during the Paleozoic where diversity rises very, very quickly in that big O is the Ordovician. We call that the Great Ordovician Expansion. But then it remains fairly level except for the end Ordovician and late Devonian mass extinctions. It remains pretty consistent for a very long period of time before it takes big nosedive at the end of the Paleozoic with the Perma-Triassic mass extinction. And then we've had this really linear increase in 
diversity since that time moving toward the modern that's accounted almost entirely for by this uh, so-called modern fauna. So this feature of non-change is something that's interested us for a very long time. And it goes against processes that are occurring all the time, processes of change. So they're evolutionary processes, mutation, selection, adaptation, the uh, Darwinian evolutionary cycle. There are also geospheric properties. There's climate change and climate fluctuations that occur all the time on timescales ranging from years to multiple millennia to millions of years, tectonic processes that are slower to unfold, but are nonetheless extremely significant in shaping the history of life and is also something that's unfolding all the time on multiple timescales. So the planet and the biota is constantly changing, yet at some level we have this this uh, sort of nested hierarchy of non-change. And by nested hierarchy, you say we, there's a lot of talk of species stasis. So when you look at the history of a species, species evolve, they arise, and they might last. On average, a species lasts for about 2 million years. For some marine invertebrates, a bit, it's a bit longer, uh, 5 million years, and then they go extinct. And during that entire span of time, there's very little change within the species from the time that it first originates, it shows up, appears in the fossil record to the time that it becomes extinct, a species stasis. And species can last for a very long period of time, unchanged. There's this taxon stability where at higher taxonomic levels, you have the origination of, of a genus of organisms, for example, and it tends to persist for a very long period of time. It rises up, it lasts, and then it goes away. There's ecological stability um, where particular communities seem to be stable and persistent for very long periods of time. There might there are changes taking place, but they're not wholesale turnovers, which um, given our view today and our concerns for what's happening with the modern ecosystem, planetary ecosystem around us is not a feature you would expect if you only had the modern world to look at. And then you take these all the way to the next levels, community persistent and ecosystem persistence, where communities and ecosystems last for millions upon millions of years with showing very little change. Uh, a lot of the thinking on why this is the case has to do with what we call incumbent species. And species that are dominant in a community in the fossil record tend to be dominant for a very long period of time. And by dominant, we usually mean uh, numerical dominance. They are common members of their communities, and sometimes it can be almost the entire community. That's not unusual today either. We know that uh, dominance can be very uneven in communities. And a lot of the explanations for why we have these long-term periods of stasis in the fossil record, ecological stasis, is because somehow these species can lock things down. And there are various reasons why people have thought this is the case. Higher rates of speciation. Once you have incumbents in there, they resist invasion from other species. They're competitive superiors, for example. Or you're simply looking at species that are really tied closely to an environment and they track an environment very closely. All of these have their problems. They tend to be poorly supported by data. There are ideas that this is something that's not a species property, but a community level property. So they're constrained some biotic interactions. Once a community is formed and it has a certain set of interactions, you really can't change it. It's resistant to, to change, ecological log, locking or ecological coordination. Those examples also do not stand up to scrutiny. They they produce v theoretically very, very fragile communities. And in contrast, what we see is a lot of robustness of communities. These communities are pretty much the same, but they do have considerable flexibility. And then there, this photo I'm showing here is of two ships passing in the night. Steve Gould suggested a number of years ago that this is all really in our minds and that these are purely random processes and we're seeing patterns where none exist. And that's a, still a fairly common argument. I won't even discuss it because it's actually, um, from a standpoint of data analysis, it's 
it's nonsense. Um, so we have incumbents, and they're a real feature. But we don't know why. We don't know what role they play. What we do know is that when you get a turnover in incumbency or in turnover in the characteristics of ecosystems, it tends to be very dramatic. And that drama is associated with extinction. And the most dramatic ones, of course, are mass extinctions. But we have large-scale regional extinctions and also dramatic local extinctions. But it's extinction. Extinctions remove incumbents, and they change the nature of communities. And this little cart series of cartoons shown on the right of the screen illustrates the transition from the Paleozoic fauna to the modern fauna. So in A, we have this Cambrian fauna. In B, we have the Paleozoic fauna that persists for a considerable period of time. But in the transition going from uh, generally between D and E to F is the end of the Paleozoic. We get this disappearance, this massive extinction of fauna. Then you get this recovery. Initially, the recovery is a Paleozoic type of recovery that goes away very quickly and then is replaced by a community that's very rich in um, large predators, for example. And shown here, we see lots of bony fish. We see what's probably the paddle of a nictiosaur, but also a lot of uh, complexification of predators in the invertebrate realm also, expansion of predatory crustaceans and mollusks. So a number of years ago, um, not too long ago actually, we put forward a hypothesis that this type of long-term long stability that characterizes ecology on the planet is generated and maintained by specific patterns of biotic interactions. And these specific patterns arise because you have lineages that are in association with each other for long periods of time. They're able to coexist and they co-evolve. And when I say a able to coexist, one of the nasty little secrets of biology is that in general, species don't like each other. In terms of ecology, if you could give a species a planet on which it could persist and exist by itself, it would be perfectly happy. Now, of course, we know that's not the case because we all rely on other species. Even the producers rely on other species to recycle nutrients and so on. But many, many, many of the encounters and relationships between species tend to be antagonistic. And one of the open questions in ecology is how can you have so many antagonistic species packed together in communities and coexist, coexist and ecosystems coexisting for very long periods of time? It's, it's still uh, an open question. But we suggest that those patterns of biotic interactions promote the longevity of species in communities. It promotes the coexistence of particular sets of species within those communities. And once you've arrived at a configuration that works for the species, it's going to have a very low likelihood of change because they're not common configurations. And being finding, if you will, or evolving, developing a configuration that is a good replacement is not going to be a common event. And one of the ways to test this is to examine an ecosystem and its sort of ecological properties before a mass extinction, during a mass extinction, and after the mass extinction, as it either recovers, reorganizes itself, or is replaced by something new. And so what we're going to do is we're going to visit uh, the best example that we have of this today. And we're going to go to the most dramatic mass extinction that we know of in the fossil record, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. It occurred 251 million years ago, and we can quibble about decimal places, and we do that a lot today, um, but it's about 251 million years ago. And in this event that lasted, um, probably the extinctions lasted no more than 60,000 years, more than 70% 70, uh, 70 of terrestrial species became extinct, and more than 80%, maybe more than 90%, of marine species became extinct. So just pause for a moment and think about going out tomorrow, if you could, given the circumstances, to one of your favorite natural environments and imagine that 70% or 80% of the species are actually absent. Okay, that is a really uh, profound change. 
in the world around you. What drove this was volcanism in what's now known as Siberia. So we have a map shown there and the various colors, the reds and the purples. And for some time, the, those colors and the blue line outline the mapped extent of this e eruptive event. For a long time, we didn't understand the processes involved or the sequences involved, but here's generally how it, how it went. We have three phases to the eruption and everything unfolds in about a million years, probably less than a million years. The first event is uh, what we call pyroclastic eruptions. They're violent eruptions that begin about 251.5 million years ago. And it would have been a real game changer for climate on the planet. What is more significant, however, is a second event that takes place sometime later where we have non-explosive eruptive flows. And so Siberia essentially opens up and lava begins to flow and it really flows. By the end of this event, we have erupted enough lava to cover the entire continent of Europe in lava about a kilometer deep. Okay, this is a massive, massive eruptive event, and there's absolutely no comparison, as we know of, in the last half billion years, even though there are events of this nature that are also quite large. And then finally, the real kicker and the real killer occurs later on in the third phase where this magmatic hotspot reactivates again. Magma moves to the surface, but it does not erupt through the surface this time. Instead, it begins to spread out in a series of sub, what we call subterranean sills. And this is lava that's infiltrating the crust of, of the Earth. And as it does so, it burns through tens of millions of years of buried carbon from the previous geologic eras where we have the first expansion and heyday of forests on the planet, they get all get buried. They're going to be peat, they're going to be coal by this time, they're buried. We have the magma going through and burning through it. And it's probably the most profound climate, climate change episode that we have on the planet for the last half billion years until we fast forward to modern times. And needless to say, all of this is pretty bad for uh, for the biosphere. So this, um, what we're going to do is take a specific look at the extinction at this time. And here's a globe showing what the planet would have looked like at this time. And we're going to focus in specifically on the Karoo Basin in South Africa. At this time, at the end of the Paleozoic, the Permian, the Karoo was a site of a very rich, very well de uh, developed, heavily forested terrestrial ecosystem. And we're going to break down the history of this ecosystem into a number of stages. So we're looking at a stratigraphic chart here, read it from the lowest levels are the oldest, going up the chart, we're moving younger. The red dotted line shows where we think the extinction boundary is. The lower daptocephalus and upper daptocephalus zones represent successive stages of this ecosystem. And then the extinction itself is broken into three phases, one, two, and three. One is a first dramatic event. And that funky little bar chart there on the right shows changing species diversity. Phase two is now we know it's a little bit less dramatic. And based on data that I need to redraw this figure now, based on data that we've been working on uh, since January this year, phase three is a second very, very dramatic event. It's also a time when even though we have a lot of extinction and the last phase of the extinction occurring, we also have our first glimpses of recovery of biodiversity. The Lystrosaurus ecosystem or community is a dramatic increase in diversity. And you could think of it as a first stage of recovery, but I'll, I'll, as I'll explain later on, that later Cygnognathus B zone is when we think recovery actually occurred. So here's how we go about doing this. We have to model these paleo communities. We can't go there and observe the ecologies, right? We can infer a lot of the ecology. We're inferring it from an exquisite fossil record. Uh, there's a record right now of more than 50,000 vertebrates, for example. And this doesn't include the invertebrates or the 
tens of thousands of plant fossils. And we have to infer the ecologies, however. And that inference happens because on we're interested in what's happening on an ecological time scale and a long ecological time scale of multiple generations. But that really pushes a resolution in the fossil record. We're also trying to think on of ecological processes on a time scale that we have not and cannot observe in the modern either. Right? Your average ecological study is about five years. It's a duration of a, of a research grant or hopefully a, a graduate dissertation, um, a bit of, bit of work. But usually our longer psychological observations now span a few decades at most. And so we want to work somewhere in between. And we're taking these long-term observations and our understanding of short-term processes, and we're going to put them together into a model of what things would have looked like back then. The models that we're going to use are food web models. And shown here is a food web, food web model of a very different community. It's a modern uh, Caribbean coral reef community, this one specifically Jamaica. And if we look at that uh, colorful network on the left, all of the little circles around the periphery, the circum circumference of the larger circle are individual species. And all of the lines between them are trophic interactions. They're predator-prey interactions. A coral reef is a very busy place, not just diverse, but energetically it's very busy. The colors that you're looking at represent four different sub-communities of the reef. You can break down the community of this reef into four sub-communities and example food chains are shown on the right. And those sub-communities tend to be defined by the energy base, whether you're looking at nano plankton producers, uh, bacterial producers, cyanobacteria, or symbiont bearing corals or macroalgae and so on, that then characterize the consumers that you find as you move up those food chains. The picture on the left is what we want for these fossil communities. And the main tools that we use, we can use evidence of direct predator-prey interactions. We use, believe it or not, um, analyses, gut content analyses, lots of gut contents preserved um, in the fossil record. We can use traces of predation, whether they're, so this early archosaur, uh, dinosaur crocodilian relative, would have left quite, quite the predatory trace on that ancient relative of ours there on, on the right. So we can infer those interactions. We can infer leaf mining interactions of insects on leaves and so on. And what we do when we collect all of this, so we collect all of the species that we know existed at a particular time and place to characterize our community, we can group those species or aggregate them into functional groups. So here is what we call a higher level or guild level food network from the Karoo Basin 251 million years ago on the eve of the extinction. Each one of the circles shows a specific functional group. And those functional groups are dictated by things such as what habitat you lived in, who your prey were likely to be, who your predators were likely to be, your body size, and so on. And so what we're doing is we're grouping species according to the similarities of their ecological interactions. We might not know the detailed differences in their ecological interactions, but if you take one of those arrows drawn between two of these groups, we know that their predator-prey interactions would have fit inside, would have been a subset of this larger or higher level um, arrow. And what we want to be able to do is to go from this aggregated functional picture, this picture of functional diversity, to a more detailed species level set of interactions. Now, there's a big challenge there, OK? Let's say we have three unique species, and we wanted to draw all of the possible food webs you could have from these species. There's one. There's another one. There's another one. In general, or not in general, exactly, with three species, you can construct, or three unique species, you can construct 20 different food webs. With four species, you can construct 476. If you do five, six, or seven species, by the time you get to seven species, seven unique species 
can arrange themselves in more than 33 million different types of food webs. By the time you get to real communities of even modest diversity, let's say um, eight dozen species, a hundred species, the number of possible food webs is beyond astronomical. So how do you go about dealing with this? We are helped by the fact that beginning on the left of this flowchart, even though we have a set of species, we do know that those species are, are partitioned functionally. So you can't simply have just any food web. You can't pick from the set of all possible food webs. You have to pick from a set of food webs that are consistent with the functional breakdown and the functional relationships that are shown in the middle flow chart to be able to produce something that you see on the right. Now, even when you do this and you break it down like we showed in one of these pictures here, you're still dealing with usually for our lower Permian or early Triassic community, you're still dealing with hundreds of millions of possible food webs, but they differ in very, very minor ways. They are all absolutely constrained to be consistent with the functional structure of their community. And this is where you have to begin thinking of that complex system kind of picture that I introduced earlier on. We won't go into the details about how we actually do that. That's a whole seminar to itself. But we're going to compare these communities in terms of their stability and their global stability. And global stability is Basically, if I give you a set of species and I tell you how they interact, how many of them, if you put them all together in a box, how many of them do you expect to be there next year? Some of them will go extinct and they will go extinct because of the asymmetric interactions and the asymmetric properties and abilities of those species. But how many of them will be in the box a year from now and how many of them will be in a box 10 years from now? That's a global stability of the system. And it's absolutely determined by, and, and this is something our work has produced a very strong result for, it's determined by the number of species in the community and in order of increasing importance, the number of functional groups in the community, how those species are partitioned among the functional groups, and that pattern of interaction among the functional groups. And to understand to be able to compare how well one of our particular fossil communities is doing, we use the path dependence nature of complex systems and say, well, what if this community, what if this ecosystem had an alternative history? And those alternative histories that we've done, we're going to look at three different types. We're going to remove the functional structure completely and say, what if we had just a bag of species and we could put them together, together in any way? In the middle, model two, we have communities that are equal in complexity to our real community, but they're arranged in very different ways. Their functional structure is different, but they're equally complex. And in model three, they have the same functional structure as our real communities. We just tinker around with how many species are in a particular functional group. So let's say our different lineages of species or our different lineages evolve differently, faster or slower than observed. And now in the last few slides to show the results, you're going to see a bunch of cubes like this. So let me explain what this cube is. This cube is looking at their three axes, that little negative sigma, the positive sigma. That's how strongly species in the model and the real communities interact. Negative interactions, impact of predators on prey, positive interactions, the impact of prey on predators, and R is the population growth rate of the species. And I won't go into details of the model, but when we put one of these food webs together and we parameterize it, if you will, somewhere along these three axes, we can calculate the global stability. And because we don't know where on these axes the real community would have sat, we look at the communities and the model communities at every single one of these points. And so each one of these cubes for each community is over uh, 9 million simulations of the food web. And then we look overall and we say, okay, I have one community here. I have another community here. We look at all possible circumstances. How do they differ? And to do that, we literally subtract one model from the next. So on the left here, the first purple one is a real community. 
on the right, we subtract from it this global stability of a random community. And then over on the extreme right are, shows the areas where they differ statistically. And that little color chart on the right is a global stability. And just think bluer, cooler colors mean better. And in this case, we can see that our real community is overwhelmingly better under all conceivable ecological circumstances than a random community of the same number of species. When we look at the Karoo system before the extinction, so shown in blue on that little chart in the top left, and during the extinction, the first two phases shown in red, the general result is that the real communities are, and beginning in the cube on the left, always more stable than random communities. When we go to the middle, we look at alternative communities that, that are just as rich, just as complex, but would result from different histories of ecological innovation. Our real communities are also always more, uh, more stable, with some exceptions, if you look at that greenish yellow area toward the top of the cube, but those are areas where ecologies tend to be quite extreme and we don't observe species very often with those properties, at least not in the modern world. And then on the right, where we're just tinkering around with where we put our species in that functional structure, more often than not, you actually could improve the food web. There's just a lot of flexibility there. What that's telling us, it's that the functional pattern of the community that really matters. So in general, functionally structured communities, more stable than randomly organized communities, real communities, are almost always more stable than modern communities with alternative eco-evolutionary histories. Then if we look now in the aftermath of the extinction, that earliest phase of recovery, so phase three, we have a lot of immigrants coming in from surrounding areas like Antarctica, for example, escaping the climate change, and you throw together certain communities, it's not a good idea. And it doesn't last for a very long period of time before it's replaced by the Lysosaurus community, where you get this massive rediversification within less than a million years, within a couple hundred thousand years of that mass extinction, diversity bounces back very profoundly, lots of species everywhere. However, let's look at the middle box here. What that's telling us is the Lysosaurus community would have been less stable than just about anything else that we could dream up. So this is a community of rebounded diversity that is ecologically, was ecologically unstable. And we would predict that it would be short-lived and would be easily replaced. And the same holes, if we tinker around with species in there, almost overwhelmingly, we could replace with something better. And we did. Okay, so um, actually a backup for a minute. If we go to the very top of the chart, Sign Ignathus B, Sign Ignathus B, which I don't show here, is a return to a very stable type of community. And Lysosaurus, even though it's spectacular, does not last a very long period of time. So the lesson there is that our real communities in the aftermath of the mass extinction were significantly less stable than our dreamt up alternatives. We would predict that those communities would be subject to unstable populations and would be geologically short lived. And finally, here's a sequence of our communities where we now compare them stepping forward in time. So that very blue box on the lower, on lowest box on the left column is comparing our two communities leading up to the mass extinction. And that cool blue color means they actually don't differ very much. Then we move into the first phase of the extinction. And the first community that's affected by the mass extinction is actually very, very stable. It's an increase in stability. And if this is counterintuitive to you, what you have to realize is what the mass extinction actually does is to whittle down that community to a very resilient core. And that continues into the uppermost box there through the mass extinction. But it, moving over now, moving through in time, we go to the right-hand column and the lowest box there. As we move into the aftermath of the mass extinction, we can see that there's a tremendous collapse of stability and that collapse persists throughout the early Triassic, even as diversity rebounds, it's simply not something that's very stable. And it's not until we move forward to the Sinagnathus zone, shown in that very last uppermost box, 
and we're talking a time period of about 7 million years before we return to something that we could argue is as stable as the ecosystem was prior to the mass extinction. I know this is a lot to swallow, but I'll summarize here. Functional structure is what determines whether your community is going to be stable or not. So having a functional structure is better than having no structure at all. Randomization of communities, which is something that's happening today with climate change and other impacts on the natural world, is not a good idea. It's a destabilizing process. Some functional structures, however, are better than others. And even though they're all better than random, the fact that the real ones that we see are better than the millions of alternatives that we can construct in the community means that the, the real ones are optimized. And whenever you see that kind of optimization in the natural world, it smacks of evolution, of evolutionary processes. So we suggest that these, this stability arises because we have long-lived co-evolving lineages and time and evolution are required for the establishment of those communities. And when you lose the product of that time and that evolution, recovery can be quite an extended process that most likely requires uh, millions of years. And we'll, I'll wrap up right there, went on for a little bit. This is showing a section, I just want to mention this actually, this uh, photograph is a section of the Permian Triassic um, it's a marine section. Uh, the boundary is way down there at the base of buff-colored um, layer. This is in the mountains of Hubei, China, um, where we were um, two, maybe three years ago now. I don't re really um, remember. And I just want to mention, late last night when I was working on this, close to midnight, I got an email from a colleague who is at the China University of Geosciences in Wuhan, He's been in Australia since December. He was there when the outbreak started in China. He stayed in Australia and he emailed me to tell me that he is on his way back to Wuhan. The campus is slowly reopening and he wanted to check in to make sure that uh, myself and my family were doing okay because of course they're getting the news of what's happening here. And he said when he got to Wuhan, um, he could go out right away and purchase a hundred or more masks for us and he would ship them overnight. And I told him that we really personally did not need the masks, but if he wanted to go ahead and do that, I would see that they were, they were donated somewhere. So um, just wanted to throw that out. It was a pretty touching thing. Okay, and I will wrap up there. Um, I'm going to try to switch back to my video. Um, please type um, a cue in the chat and they can, will call on you. Um, okay, Darko, go ahead. Hi, Darko. Do you want to turn your microphone on and ask Peter? Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I will ask you a question. Um, I'm not sure how to put it like this, but um, thinking of taphonomy and how you can look at sort of processes, um, you know, with sort of in terms of preservation, can you look at taphonomy using extant systems, um, sort of a, a taphonomy of extant food webs to try and see um, sort of in terms of preservation and things like that in the fossil food webs or webs? Yeah. Absolutely, that's a great question. And that's initially why we uh, worked on the Caribbean food web. I started looking around for modern food webs that we could use to try to ground truth some of the modeling that we were doing with the fossil food webs. And shockingly enough, we could not find any food webs of modern systems that were as species rich or as complex as our fossil systems. And there's a real, there's a real shortage. And so we decided we had to make our own. And we're not the only group that has done this. There have been a number of uh, very complex food webs put together since, but the coral reef food web still stands as the most diverse, most complex food web we have of a modern system. And we have actually done sort of experiments with the modern food web 
fossilizing it and saying, what would the coral reef of Jamaica look like if we crunched it through the fossilization process? How well do we do? What details do we lose? How much uh, distortion is introduced into the system? And the good news is it actually does quite well. Um, you do lose things, of course, you lose species diversity, but the overall functional structure is preserved. And even though you lose the sort of like the trophic structure, there's a lot of collapsing of that. There's actually modeling that we can do that we had started using prior to this test with our uh, fossil food webs anyway, that actually restores the, uh, the trophic structure of the community. And so we think we're doing uh, fairly well with the fossil communities. And this is also something that tells us that when it comes to modern communities, where we're of course so challenged logistically to put these things together, we don't need all the details to be able to do this. And you know, frankly, of course, we know we're running out of time and in some cases we're running out of species to get all of the details with modern systems. Wow, thank you. Okay, Darko looks like he's ready. Yes. Hi, Peter. Uh, when you show us the sequence of uh, how the stability of the community changed before, during, and after the mass extinction, mm -hmm. you said that the time frame was about six to seven million years altogether. Yes. That is slightly longer than the average life of a volcanic island. So I was wondering, would that mean that if we do the same type of analysis on food webs or communities on yeah. volcanic islands, we will find them that are all the time kind of in this unstable situation or the assembly there happens quickly enough and somehow it becomes stable between the first 100,000 years? Or like if we do the same analysis and we compare Big Island, Maui, Kauai, will be all the time unstable or what are your thoughts on that? So that is an excellent question, Darko. And I think about that a lot, you know, in our terms of our modern systems or when a system arises, how much time is required. And I think the, the speed with which you can get to this sort of globally stable state probably depends somewhat on the, the species involved, of course, and the intensity and the intimacy of the coevolutionary interactions. And maybe it's possible or probable that on islands, this process can be accelerated. And so an island will arrive at this point in a fraction of the time that a more open system might, for example. On the other hand, it's entirely possible that these systems are in a constant dance of not really being in equilibrium. And I'll give you a more dramatic example where a uh, really interesting open question we have concerns northern boreal forests um, today. These forests all emerged and they emerged very quickly from the retreat of glaciers about 10,000 years ago. But given the generation times involved in a lot of the foundational species of these communities, the trees, for example, it's quite probable that boreal forests are still on their way 10,000 years later to some kind of equilibrium process. So the answer to your question is, I don't know, but it's, it would be, it's something we can, we can do and we, we can question. Um, and it'd be a really, really very interesting thing to do, question to tackle. All right, Shannon, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, um, I, hi, Peter. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I was going to say, I bet generation time is important, and I appreciated your pandemic presentation as a complex system. I bet their generation time being so short, they reach equilibrium more quickly than we might do. Um, my question is, well, first of all, I wanted to say that was the prettiest uh, mathematical modeling-based talk I've ever seen. I'm sorry, I lost you there for a moment. The, the, the what? It's the, it was the prettiest mathematical modeling based talk I've ever seen. <laughs> I took a lot of the ugly bits out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wanted to ask you, you said that, um, you mentioned it in your talk and in reply to Natalie that sometimes the details don't matter. 
Yep. And I wanted to, and maybe they don't ever matter. I don't know. But I wanted to ask you, how do you measure or assess the impact of uncertainty? And what about when that uncertainty is uneven or biased? For example, we might know a lot more detail about some things than we do about other things. Yeah. So the one of the ways, the main way to tackle this is the, the uncertainty, at least in this case, for example, uh, centers around the details of the interspecific interactions. And so the way that you deal with that is you, you look across the range of uncertainty and you compare all of, if you change the details, um, how, how significantly do the results change? And we're able, of course, to do that with computational power now. And so we can do that across millions and millions of iterations of the uncertainty. And so we know, at least in the case of these food webs, that it's that higher level functional structure that really exerts a strong top-down control on, on the dynamics. And so we, we can assess it in that way. And remember, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> Uh, well, that was uh, that's uh, it's kind of answering it. But if there's biases and uncertainty yeah. across the scope that might be pocketed in certain relationships or lineages, sure. Um, the biases uh, the biases tend to do or tend to occur around groups that are less well known than others. And one of the basic things about being less well known is you simply have a poor or absent fossil record. And let's consider, for example, with, uh, with the coral reef. Uh, one of the most important components of modern oceans are our microzooplankton uh, crustaceans, um, generally copepods. Copepods are one of the most abundant animals on the planet, yet copepods have an almost non-existent fossil record. You can go into your fossil coral reef and you can identify lots of organisms that are preying upon these microzooplankters, yet you have no preservation of them. So what do you know about them? And really, crucially, how do you estimate their, their diversity? So you can make a little functional box or circle for them, but what's the size of the number that you put in there? And that's a very difficult uh, obstacle to surmount. We can do it with modern plankton because there's this very wonderful, bizarre linear relationship between the richness of zooplanktivores and the richness of their zooplankton prey. We can do the same thing with insects in the terrestrial fossil record. And so insects were one of the real bugbears here that came up when we started working with late Cretaceous dinosaur dominated communities. And we, in, in North America, we just knew we had communities because of the plants, because of many of the in insectivores, that they were insect rich, yet the insect record is very spotty. So we combed through the fossil record, the terrestrial fossil record of about the last 350 million years. And we looked for instances, so-called Lagerstaten, or instances of exquisite fossil preservation, where we had good preservation of uh, insectivores, uh, mostly uh, mammals, but birds also, and the insects. And we did the same thing. We, we compared those richnesses and there is a highly regular relationship between insectivore richness and insect richness spanning about 300 million years of Earth's history. It's not something we have any kind of explanation for, but those are some ways of dealing with the bias, but those biases exist. And in some cases I think would largely prohibit you um, and it wouldn't prohibit you from doing this kind of work but it means that you have to have some way of blowing up your uncertainty so that it in your results so that it reflects the uncertainty in your data. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, sorry. Um, we don't have any more questions unless anybody has a last minute question, but um, with that, thank you so much, Peter, for presenting to us today. Um, and we'll see you all next week. Um, Jack Dumbacker will be talking to us. Okay, thank you, everybody, and stay well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.